Good morning, my friends. Welcome to worship at Zion United Church of Christ in Delaware, Ohio. I'm Reverend Fred Arzola. To our guests, a special welcome. We're so glad that you're with us today. And if you are on Facebook, please do greet one another. Sarah Jackson is your online host. And we invite you to comment and to post your prayer requests. There are four core values about our community of faith that we share at the gathering of our service. First, our mission is to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Second, we believe that God is still speaking in the world and in our lives. Third, we trust that God's love will change our lives. We gather together as a community of faith to celebrate and experience this love with God and with each other. Fourth, we are an open and affirming congregation. We are a diverse and inclusive community of faith, cherishing every person and committed to welcoming every person on their spiritual journey, specifically including the LGBTQIA community. Today is the ninth Sunday of Pentecost. And we continue during this season to explore the life of the church and the people of God. We begin, as we always do on Sundays, by lighting the Christ candle. The Christ candle reminds us that Christ is the light that centers us and guides us. Please rise in body and spirit and join me in the centering for worship. Come, hear the call of God, speak of me to my people. But we are just ordinary folks 
who will listen? I will give you the words. I will always be with you as you speak my words of truth and justice and love. Gather here to worship you, to praise you for your loving presence, and to be strengthened for the calling you have given us. My friends, please join us in singing our gathering hymn, Come My People. Please join me in the gathering prayer. O oh God, in the midst of the cacophony of voices that crush our spirit and deny our calling, voices that say, who do you think you are? We come to hear your voice of affirmation. We come to hear your voice calling us to be and do what you have called us to be and do. Let this time of worship quiet our fears, soothe our bruised souls, and energize us for ministry in and with your beloved world. Let faith abide, let hope abide, let love abide, here in this space, here in our community, here in our world, and most of all, here in us. Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. God of grace, who are we that you should care for us? And yet you surprise us with grace, infuse us with hope, and teach us a better way. Make us ever more faithful and ever more grateful as we watch for the coming of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Please be seated. We now invite the children from kindergarten through grade five to Sunday school. We pray blessings on our children and we pray blessings on our teacher today.
And I saw some dancing at the opening hymn over here, and it was wonderful. We need to dance more. I never dance, so I need to dance more. Thank you for that. I have the pleasure of introducing Reverend Dave Long Higgins. Reverend Higgins is the conference minister for the Heartland Conference of the United Church of Christ. Prior to beginning his role with the conference, Dave was a parish pastor for over 30 years. Together with his wife, Reverend Beth Long Higgins, Dave served two congregations, Bethany UCC in Louisville, Kentucky, and David's United Church of Christ in Canal Winchester, Ohio. Please join me in welcoming Dave Long Higgins. You may have noticed that Fred and I are of different stature. Um, Fred, thank you for that kind introduction. And friends, what a delight it is to be with you this morning and to, to be with my own church family. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in, in just a minute. But first, I want to invite you to hear our scripture passage this morning. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. This is one of those you have probably heard so frequently that maybe it's magic and mystery have, have kind of lost their edge for you. I hope not, but maybe that's the case. Our text is 1 Corinthians 13, and if you've ever been to a wedding or maybe funeral or other special event, you, you may have heard this along the way a lot, but I don't want your familiarity with it to rob it of its power. So I invite you to hear this this morning as if you're hearing it for the first time, okay? Will you join your heart with mine as we, as we hear this sacred text from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth? If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I gain nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Say it with me. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. May God bless to us the reading and the hearing, the understanding and the savoring of this holy word. Let us pray. O holy and gracious love, former of our lives, holder of our journeys, light among lights, 
grant us a renewed sense of your presence here now. Strengthen us such that we may discover again our lives renewed by your Holy Spirit. O oh God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that they might be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Again, friends, I, I want to share what a delight it is to, to be with all of you this morning. Often, as some of you know, I'm on the road on Sunday mornings, bringing greetings actually from you, from Zion Church, to the wider Heartland Conference of the United Church of Christ, and to the other congregations in my work and care serving you and those other 322 congregations that make up our life together. Most of those congregations are in Ohio, one in West Virginia, and eight in Northern Kentucky across the river from Cincinnati. But today, I offer greetings to you from all of those congregations and also from all of our partners in so many expressions of health and human service ministries, our global partners in 90 countries, nearly 300 global partners around the world. But from that global picture that I painted, it's my privilege this morning to join with a wonderful line of others who have preached this summer during Pastor Beth's sabbatical, sharing a bit of my own story. And as I do so, I want to frame my sharing with you this morning in this way. <clears throat> we are all instruments of God's perpetual tuning. We are all instruments of God's perpetual tuning for a song of love that we are given birth to sing into the life of the world. You got it? You are an instrument of God's tuning to sing a song of God's love into the life of the world. I want you to hold on to that. Now, for those of you who think, I can't hold a tune in a bucket, let me assure you that God, who is love, capital L, has got you covered. Because you see, the song gets sung in as many different ways as there are creatures who inhabit the earth. Just listen to the crickets, and you'll know what I'm talking about, right? So I want to start this morning in a somewhat strange place in telling you a bit of my own journey, hoping that it may evoke something for you of your remembrance and contemplation of your own journey and about God's alive movement of love in that journey. A couple of weeks ago, my siblings and I and our spouses and a few nephews and cousins gathered over in New Philadelphia to inter my father's ashes some two and a half years after his death, just prior to COVID. He did not die from COVID, but COVID prevented us from gathering again to inter his ashes. Following our time at the cemetery, we took a little roots tour down to Stone Creek. Any of you ever heard of Stone Creek, Ohio? I'm not surprised. Oh, a few, good. You may know, you, some of you know then that it's 200 people, cats and dogs. Uh, a, crossroad, really. Um, it's where the four oldest of us six siblings lived the first years of our life, where my dad, who was, also, who was a pastor, served his first parish there. And if you've ever done a tour like this, you know that seeing sights as an adult that you have held in your, ha in your head and in your mind and heart as memories from childhood can be quite a powerful thing. The first thing I noticed that everything I remembered being so big has strangely gotten a lot smaller over the years. Things are not as far apart as I remembered them being, nor are they quite as large, except for the pine trees that were planted as seedlings and now are giants. So we walked around the church building, which was built while my dad was pastor. And when I say built, I mean literally built by the members my dad would mix mortar from six in the morning until three afternoon in the afternoon and then do his work because the bricklayers were members of the congregation, as were all of the carpenters. As we walked around the building, I came upon the cornerstone and engraved, I noticed, was this year, 1962, the year of my birth. And in that turning, I remembered being told by my parents that I was born on World Day of Prayer that year. 
and that my father almost missed the service for which he was the preacher because of my birth. In some ways, I've always had a sense that something of me was shaped by the united spiritual energy of that day. I cannot explain it. I only know that prayer in its many forms has been like a magnet of mystery that has pulled at me and continues to pull at me in my life. I have a sense that you probably know what I'm talking about. We were fortunate on this day of our Roots tour to find some folks working inside the building who let us in to walk around not only inside the building, but inside our memories, if you know what I'm talking about. In that space, I could remember my father telling my brothers and me, and I was probably no older than two or three, so one of my earliest memories, you boys stay out of the way of these men. They have important work to do. These men were the men of the church who were bringing in the pews to the sanctuary to bolt them down to the floor, attaching them in preparation for the building deck dedication, which I later learned in my father's retelling of the story, was the next day. Not too long after that, on a Sunday morning in that sanctuary where, there, where, where those pews were bolted down, sitting in those pews, actually standing probably, during the singing of a hymn, I don't remember which one, I remember pausing and becoming aware that there was something much more going on in that space than I could have named. It was almost like what I would call singing plus. There were no visions, though I do trust that such things happen. There was simply a sense that we were being held by something or someone larger than ourselves. Because I was a PK, you know what a PK is? Preacher's kid, okay? It was expected that I would go to church. But this was not something that I resisted. I think it was because I could sense something important growing in me. And in some way, it had to do with God, even if I wasn't sure how much of the time. Maybe, maybe it was because in my family, faith was not just a Sunday thing. It was a life thing, as I know it is for you. My father, having taken a plane load of 150 pigs to southern India in 1964 for Heifer International, three men and a plane load of pigs, just get that in your mind for a minute, <laughs> had developed a number of international friendships. He traveled after the delivery of the pigs in what was then called Bombay. Among those friends, especially, were a married couple who were both doctors from India who would come to visit our home and stay with us. In this way, the world came to visit our home, by that time, in rural northwestern Ohio. These doctors, Raj and Maybell Aroli, would later be awarded the Asian equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Medicine for their development of the Comprehensive Rural Health Project in southern India, bringing medical care for the first time to some of the poorest of the poor in the world. What I remember is real Indian curry dishes make you sweat. And I remember lots of laughter. It did not occur to me until I was much older that this was quite an extraordinary experience of life, to have the world come and visit our home. What I did know was that these doctors who were Christian could have stayed in the United States and been paid six-figure salaries in the late 1960s. They graduated number one, number two in their postdoc from Johns Hopkins University but they remained committed to a vision of living their faith for the people of their own country. Here, the seeds of connection between a deep spirituality and a deep engagement with the world were sown. They were sown in stories of people whose lives were transformed by a gospel that wasn't words on a page, but by a word incarnated in doctors who trained nurses to be the presence of Christ without proselytizing as a condition for care, as was so often the case back then, and sometimes even as now. But it wasn't just these times 
with special guests that gave rise to a a sense of spirit moving in our family's midst. It was the daily conversations of our family guided by parents who lived love with a remarkable congruence that made such a difference. Around the dinner table, we talked about the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War and the call of faith for forming a different kind of world. The seeds of imagination envisioning a world where all God's people could flourish and live without fear, were planted at that table and sometimes on the couch. Let me explain. One sunny April afternoon, my dad came home from church early and told me that we were going to watch television together. It was very unusual for my dad to do this. He never came home in the middle of the day to watch TV. So we turned on in our little family room our black and white television and the screen showed Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s family sitting in a pew. It was Dr. King's funeral service. Some of you may remember that they played recordings of snippets of his most famous speeches and sermons, like the speech from the night before his his assassination. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. You may remember that one. And of course, the part of his I Have a Dream speech where he articulated a vision of a world where his children would be, not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. My father and I sat on the couch, his arm around my shoulder, holding me lovingly close. And then... I felt a wetness on my elbow and I looked up and I saw that my father was weeping. And he told me, David, this is what it is about. And I know that the it that he was talking about was the gospel of Jesus Christ and a vision for a different kind of world. And something in that moment in me shifted recognizing that one cannot be a Christian and ignore the hurt of the world in its many expressions, though I have to tell you, I keep learning and learning again, ever anew, how to engage this call better, especially at this age that I'm at now. Now, for as powerfully loving as my father's presence in preaching was, my mother's role was also powerfully present and important. Together, they were a dynamic duo, but my mother usually more quietly so. One day she mentioned to me that the Ohio State quarterback Rex Kern was said to read the Bible every day. Do you remember Rex Kern, some of you? Lancaster boy, quarterback for Ohio State. Somehow that stuck in me, and I started to read the Bible. I mean, really read the Bible. Now, a lot of it didn't make sense to me, I must admit. But one night, one night, I was reading from 1 Corinthians, and I landed on 1 Corinthians 13, and something landed deep in me. I had no visions, just a deep sense that love is everything, everywhere, in all time, and even beyond time. It was words but more than words, dare I say, beyond words. And I realize that this is what it, as in our lives, are really about. Call it energy plus, purpose plus, aliveness plus, vision plus. I cannot fully explain it, but from that point forward, I wanted more of this. And it continues to be beyond my words. These verses especially became a mantra for me. I want you to hear them again. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Imagine for a moment, if you will, what the world would be like if every day, every human being 
would say and then meditate on these words for just five minutes. It would be a game changer. It can be a game changer. It must become a game changer for us. Yes? Only later would I learn that scholars think that this quite likely was a song of the early church. Remember, we are songs in formation, right? Only later would I learn that this song was being offered by the Apostle Paul because the early church was on the verge of blowing apart due to rivalries and factions and all those things Paul refers to as katasarks that draw human beings away from their higher angels and from each other and from the love, capital L, whom we call God. Yes, I wanted more and more of this, not to be selfish, but because I knew I could not be complete apart from it. There was emotion and energy set loose in me that wanted to share this love with others. I couldn't explain it, nor could I get it out of my heart and mind. But how would this grow? About the same time, the gift of deep silence visited itself in my life. I was drawn to meditation, but back then there weren't many books in my childhood about Christian meditation. I read about other religions' practices and learned much from them. And then one day I went to our local library. And you know how at the library they often put out the new books or recommendations from the librarian? And there was one. Christian meditation. I checked it out. And I read as much as my young heart was ready to receive. I would return the book. You remember back in the days you had to take books back and then check them out again, right? You remember that day? Okay. So I would return the book and I would check it out again and again and again over the next year. That whole year, I think I was the only one who checked out that book, mostly because I don't think I gave anybody else a chance. You had to check it out, give it back, give it a day, and go back and get it. So it required some effort, I want to tell you. I would spend time sitting underneath the canopy of a beech tree that was in the, our front yard. Now, you need to know, I was in like a regular town, so this was not exactly a normal thing to be doing, okay? But I discovered there, kind of like here, an energy of spirit that I could not explain, but which seemed to be calling me. Then, one summer day, during my junior high years, I happened upon a yard sale that our neighbors were having. The father of the family that was holding the yard sale was a math professor, but he was very deeply spiritual. And he'd placed some of his books out on the table as part of the yard sale. Books about the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, and Gerhard von Rad's New Testament or Old Testament theology, and a book by Thomas Merton, among others. He noticed that I was looking at these books and he asked, are you interested in these things? And I said, yes. Very quickly, he went into his house and he came back with a brown paper bag. He filled the bag entirely with these books and he handed it to me and he said, you will probably need these. What a seventh grade grader need with Gerhard von Rod's Old Testament theology, I have no idea. That one would have to wait until seminary. What I do know is that I was introduced to the writings of Thomas Merton and thus began a journey of spiritual discovery about the contemplative life that I had been hungering for my whole short life. It was about this time that it became clear to me that I had a calling to ordain ministry that I could not avoid, though Beth will tell you that I knew this from the time I was born. And now that I've shared my story with you, I guess maybe at a certain level she's right. So just let it be public. <laughs> she was right. It only took her 38, 40, 42 years to hear that, right? No, no. Yeah. This is the day, see, when we were preaching together, th this happened all the time, right, right, yeah. So, I told my best friend, Steve, that I felt I had a call to ministry. And he immediately confirmed it by saying, Dave, you should absolutely do that. 
Only now do I realize what a special gift it was to have, as an eighth grade boy, to have a male friend sensitive enough to be available to receive such precious pondering and vulnerability with support, love, and grace. Fast forward, I'm skipping a lot, I've told you probably too much, to college, where Beth could not get rid of me because we were both music and psychology majors and also were leaders in the same faith group on campus. I don't think stalking is the right word. I like to use keen interest, just for the record. But there, there I discovered a life partner in Beth. Didn't expect this. Who loved and loves me deeply and carried and carries so many gifts for ministry, but that's another 10,000 sermons, and we don't have time for those this morning. Landing at United Theological Seminary, the Twin Cities, together we discovered that we had landed at the epicenter of landmark thinking, thinking about the full inclusion of LGBTQIA persons in the life of the church. This was back in the 80s. It was due to the writing of uh, our Christian ethics professor, Reverend Dr. James B. Nelson, who wrote the landmark book, Embodiment, which broke open this vision of a radically inclusive church back in 1978. But something much more pivotal happened even than that. One of our seminary friends who had played piano professionally before coming to sem seminary wondered if some of us might want to get together and see if we could put some music together. Remember, Bethel and I were both music and psychology majors, so we thought, oh, this sounds interesting. It turned out to be actually transformative because Rick was a pianist, Beth also a pianist, but also a flautist. Beth played her flute, and I played my violin, and Rick played the piano, and we formed what was called the Free Sense Ensemble. Free Sense came from a book that we were all reading at the time, and it described those times when we're sufficiently in touch with ourselves to be able to be present to each other. It was what we hoped would happen when folks heard us play, a kind of joining together that was more than just the performers and the listeners, but a mutual delight and joy. What also happened, though, was that we learned to be fully present to each other as the songs wove something larger of love, capital L, in and through us. We also got to know Rick as an openly gay man who lovingly tended our question, questions and offered his story in ways that transformed our lives and that of my parents too. Following seminary against our preset criteria to not live south of the Ohio River or work together in the same setting of ministry, you know, we make plans and God laughs, right? Love swept us to Louisville, Kentucky, where together we served a redevelopment congregation for eight and a half years. Our love grew exponentially as our two children were born there. In 1996, that same love song called us to serve a congregation whose pastor, choir director, and treasurer had all died in the same month, June of 1995. So we landed at David's United Church of Christ in Canal Winchester. Another remarkable community of faith. A community of love and joy, like this one. There are too many stories to tell from that wonderful chapter that led to the work each of us is doing now. Beth in ministry related to folks in the last third of their lives, and me in conference ministry. But here's the thing. Each of these stories, if you haven't noticed, have been stitched together with a love larger than words can convey. Now, friends, I want you to hear this. That same spirit is at work in you. Do you know this? Let me tell you it's the truth. I see it in you. Its name is love, capital L, capital O, capital V, capital E. 
And it has drawn you to this place and this time to discover an unfolding that stretches way back before time even began to be measured, but which we are invited to remember through a sacred meal we call communion, given to remind us of the mystery of God's continual coming, forming a new creation in each of us and in all of us together. So friends, let us gather at this table of remembering that we may be remembered, made ever more whole by the one who calls us to sing the song of love with our whole lives, that the world might become just a little bit more whole. What a blessing this is. What a privilege. I give thanks to God for each of you, dear friends, and for God's unfolding mystery of love in your story. And I give thanks to God for our life together. Godspeed. Amen and amen. I invite you to a, a moment of meditation, especially I hope that you will Pay attention to something of God stirring in your own story. Dave, thank you for that. That was so beautiful, so meaningful. Thank you. We now share our joys and concerns. And we have um, a number of prayers that were written in our prayer book today. Let's pause for a moment of just quiet reflection. Just to center ourselves. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us. Lord, I lift up everyone here at worship with us, on the lawn, online. We lift up our congregation, our community. Lord, you know our needs and our desires, our wants, our wounds. Bless us. Lord, very specifically, we pray for the flood victims in eastern Kentucky. We pray for the victims of gun violence. We pray for our members, Steve and Tiffany, for success and satisfaction in his weightlifting competition. We pray for a family that's still recovering from COVID. We pray for the Miller family at the loss of a nephew. And we pray for one of our Bible study participants, William, who has asked for prayers as he awaits his sentence. And we pray for Alan and Julie as they travel together on a cruise. And Lord, into your hands we entrust these prayers and the prayers that we keep silent in our hearts. Amen.
My friends, on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate Holy Communion. And as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let us consider the words of Scripture, which invite us to examine ourselves first and only then to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so once again, let us pause for a moment and examine our own hearts. Please join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Most merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and follow in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. My friends, let us hear the words from Psalm 103. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. Amen. Please join me in the great thanksgiving. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is good and right and a joyful thing to give you thanks always and everywhere, O God Almighty. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. We praise you for forming us in your image and for calling us to be your people. Although we rebelled against your love, you did not abandon us, but sent to us prophets and teachers to guide us on the journey. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who took on human form to live and die as one of us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite us in one holy church. Therefore, with the entire company of saints, in all places and all times, we praise you with joy, saying the Sanctus, Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe shouts your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that, be, that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into him, Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, Take, drink, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, the bread we eat and the cup we drink is the communion of the body and blood of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God 
come for all things are ready. My friends, everyone is welcome at this communion table. Children may partake at their parents' or guardians' discretion. Wine is dark red, juice is clear, gluten-free bread has toothpicks. Please hold the elements until everyone has received them. Then we will eat and drink communion together as one body. We also ask that you dispose of the juice cups after the service.
Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. <clears throat> Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ so that we may faithfully proclaim the goodness of your love, making your universal church a rainbow of light in an uncertain world Amen. My friends, as always, we want to thank you for your generosity, your gifts to Zion. Support our neighborhood, our community, our ministries, and the people who are touched by the church. We have provided you several ways to give. You can go directly to the church website and click on the donation button on the home page. We've created a QR code that will take you straight to the donation page. You'll find it at the bottom of your bulletin. And for those of you worshiping at home, it's on your screen. If you prefer to give cash or a check uh, donation, you may use the envelopes found on the hospitality table. Simply place the envelopes in the offering plate. Or you can mail your donation to the church office. And once again, thank you for your generous gifts. As always, I'm so glad to see that you have joined us in worship this morning, both in person and online. If you're new, I would love to meet you. There is a second QR code that will take you straight to the welcome page. You'll also find it on the bottom of your bulletin and on the screen. And you'll also find some contact cards on the hospitality table, and you could leave them in the offering plate. And if you share this information with me, I'll make sure to contact you. And if you're with us on the lawn, please do join us for coffee and tea after worship. As always, we need your help with the setting up and breaking down for summer worship. If you are willing to help us, especially in the technology area, please speak with Brian White, and we are happy to have you back, Brian. Welcome back. And please do take a prayer request from the people who have been impacted by the justice system in the, in the Delaware County Jail, we prayed for someone today. Um, and for more information on this really important ministry, on the jail ministry, please contact Sam Gettert. During the month of August, we continue with our summer book club. Uh, we are studying the text written by Reverend Howard Thurman called Jesus and the Disinherited. And this book, this book reflects the aspect of our mission to do justice. The discussion will be facilitated by Dr. Tejai Beulah Howard this Wednesday, August 10th at 7 p.m. at our lower level space. Please do join us. Zion's week of hosting Family Promise starts on Sunday, August 14th. If you are interested or would like some more information, Please speak with Mike Newcomb. And please do save the date for Sunday, August 21st. It's our end of summer potluck uh, meal. And following the service, uh, we will also celebrate. On that day, we are celebrating Pride Sunday. And we also welcome back Pastor Beth from her sabbatical. So please do bring an entree or a salad or dessert. Beverages and cutlery will be provided. Uh, there's no grill this time, but if you would like to bring something in a crock pot, please speak with Sue Frederick uh, so we can plan ahead and provide space to keep it plugged in during the service. 
Uh, Pastor Beth and I have been texting each other recently just to talk about her transition, and she's very excited to be back, and we're so grateful uh, for her presence and her leadership in our lives here. Well, my friends, please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing our closing hymn, Whose Giving Knows No Ending. So friends, let me remind you, you are a song of God's singing. It is not just you singing, but God singing in and through you. And if you ever forget, remember that this blessing holds your life. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. May you know always the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. Amen and amen.
Amen.